Jesus the King. So the title of our series is Elect Jesus. And we're keying in off the election. But today we're going to start keying in. Jesus is the King. Oh, it's going to be good. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to put me on as your microphone. Open the ears of our hearts. Help us not just to hear natural words, but help us to hear spiritual words for their life. Change us, transform us. There's somebody here sitting here, they don't know you, or they're even trying to figure out if you're real. I pray you reveal yourself to them in a very special way. And even as this message goes on, I pray for every struggle that's out there that you touch, the person. And I pray you give wisdom, guidance, love, acceptance, that the people in this place would know how loved they are by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Part one, Jesus versus Barabbas. People sometimes would choose a lie over the truth because the truth makes them uncomfortable. We found out that people can uh, be swayed easily by the opinions of others, and sometimes the voice of a few can influence the multitudes. Part two, we talked about the Word of God shaping our world view, and we talked about, even with this current election, some of the things, current issues, for instance, that the Bible does have a very strong stance on. And as you go into this election, I want to encourage you to pray for our election, for our country. I've heard it from some of the most brilliant Christian minds, and I've even heard it from some of the most brilliant non-Christian minds that the future freedoms of our country are at stake in this election. And I happen to believe that personally. And I want to encourage you. I believe in Indiana. We tend to vote certain ways, and you kind of know how Indiana is going to go. But some of our friends in the rest of the country, they don't always follow along. And I'm just praying for the sake of our freedoms that God's, hand, God's will be done more than anything else. God's will be done. And I will share this, say, Pastor, what would happen if we lost our freedoms? What would happen if, you know, all hell broke loose? What would happen if, you know, this, that, and the other? What, what would happen? You know what? Jesus is still the king and the Lord. We're going to keep having church. We're going to keep doing what we do. I'm not going to lose my joy over it, are you? And I have prayed. I have wondered in prayer sometimes. And I've, I've, I've told God, God, if you need to bring our country to its knees so that we would repent and, and have salvation versus prosperity or the freedoms that we have, do what you need to do because it's more important that these people get to heaven than they just simply have the, the right to assemble or get lots of packages from Amazon on a regular basis. So, Lord, I, I don't know about your prayer, but my prayer is, Lord, I give you permission and your sovereign knowledge that is so far above mine that if you feel you need to bring us to our knees, do what you got to do. And I could use to lose a few pounds. You know, most of us could. So, you know, we would just have to figure it out and we just have to choose to have joy regardless. Amen? Amen. That's not the message today. We took a whole service to talk about Israel and the conflict over there on October 6th here. And then October 7th was the one-year anniversary. We talked about that and what God's viewpoint on Israel is and why that is so important. And then last week, we began to open up with the government is upon his shoulders. That's a prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9. It's only mentioned one time in the Bible, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born... Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Now watch that, 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 little, that little thing right there, see? The increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. It's eternal. And, 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 and it's, it's talking about increase. You know, 
God is a God of increase. I, I, I want to, you know, some people might wonder, Pastor, you know, our, our church is full. Our church is doing well. Why do you feel the need to be out knocking on doors on a Saturday morning telling people Jesus loves them? Because God is a God of increase. He desires that none should perish. And, and even when we see for eternity, I, I'm giving you my opinion on this. This is my opinion. But I, I, believe, I, I see, and we've been studying this on Wednesday nights too, is I believe that in eternity we're going to have assignments and roles and jobs. And I believe that God is not done with creation. I believe, the, as we know, the universe is still expanding at the speed of light. And I believe, with, with my heart, I believe we're going to have something to do with taking the rest of that universe and causing it to be blessed and beautiful and, and the, establishing the kingdom of Jesus Christ all over the universe. Isn't that cool? I mean, I don't, I don't know. Maybe we get a planet. I don't know. But I, I, want, I want something like that. That would be cool. But here we see Jesus is being prophesied about. It says you're going to, he's going to be the head of all the government. Now there's going to be a government. See, if it was just a king, it would just be Jesus, but there's going to be a government. That means there's going to be other people. See, people sometimes say, well, they, they have this mentality, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. Wrong. You don't love Jesus. I love Jesus, but I hate people. Wrong. You cannot love Jesus and hate people. You can't do it. The Bible makes that very clear. Now, do I hate some of the things that people do? Yes. Do we hate what humanity is capable of? Yes. But we cannot hate people. Jesus died for people. Jesus shed his blood for people. Even people we don't like. And, and, and people, you know, sometimes they have a problem with church. You know, I, I love Jesus, but I just don't want to go to church. I, well, I, I, and they say, I don't like organized religion. What do you think heaven is? Heaven is an, or, ha, ha, if you would just open this thing up for five minutes, five minutes, everything God does is organized. What time was it when you got here today? Well, some of you, 10.05, but 10. How do we know it was 10 o'clock? Because the earth rotates perfectly. How do we know this time of year? Well, we don't know. To wear a coat or shorts or have your air conditioning, it's Indiana, you, you're never going to know. But we, know, we even know that we're not going to know. <laughs> Heaven is very organized. I, 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 we read, the heavenly city has a very specific layout. Everything about heaven is organized. And there's going to be a government. Well, I don't want some man telling me what. There's going to be pastors and priests in heaven. That's biblical. You don't have to search very far to find that. And so when people say things like, I love God, but not the church, or I love God, but not people, what you're saying is, I don't want to go to heaven. Because it's going to be full of people. And if you think Hoosiers, other Hoosiers make you uncomfortable, wait till you're in heaven with some former Muslim. Wait till you're in heaven when the Pakistanis get to lead praise and worship. It's going to be awful. I'm just going to prepare you. I, I, I love those people, but their music is terrible. And dear God, if we have to go over to their house and they cook for us, just, just know, eat before you go. <laughs> Y'all have some of your family like that? You're going over to their house for dinner. What do you do? You stop at McDonald's on the way. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Hallelujah. And if your family keeps coming in and they smell like McDonald's and it happens routinely, it's you. Ahem. <laughs> <coughs> So we're just in the introduction so far. I'm, as you can tell, I, I love this stuff. But, but Jesus is king. Number one, we're going to look at three points today based on Jesus being king. Number one, the timing of Jesus is not the timing of man. I want to take you back to the triumphant entry. It's called the Passion Week, the week before the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. 
And on a Monday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of an unbroken donkey. That's, that's a five-part series right there. When you think of the miracle that Jesus rode an unbroken colt, and that thing did not buck him off, that is miraculous. And he's riding into town, and for the last three years, he's been healing everybody. He's been feeding everybody. He's been defying the religious system of the day. He's been confounding everybody. His teachings are amazing. His miracles are astounding. They, they've heard about this guy walks on water. This guy calms the storm. This guy, he feeds the thousands. This guy, he heals leprosy. He raises the dead. They've heard about him. And now he's riding in on a donkey into the heart of Jerusalem. And the people think this is it. Because they were oppressed by the Roman government. Israel did not have a government at this time. They had been conquered by the Romans. The Romans had a leadership there in Israel. The Jews hated the Romans. The Romans hated the Jews. The Romans were mean to the Jews. That's why we have in the Bible when Jesus said, if someone asked you to go one mile, go two. What would happen is the soldiers would just commandeer any random Jew. The soldier needed work done. The soldier would look at you and say, hey, you, get over here carry this load. Hey, you, give me your coat. And that's why when Jesus said, if they tell you to go one mile, go two, he was saying, do serve the person who's oppressing you, serve the person who's being mean to you, serve the person who is using you, not only go the mile they ask, go the extra mile. You know, we need to put that mentality, we, we got to start remembering Christianity has a conduct that goes with it, you see. And I'm all for, I, I appreciate the blessing of God that comes on us as a result of working the principles of the Word of God. There is a blessing that comes on us when that happens. But don't ever think that the blessing is the only part of Christianity. There is a love and a sacrifice for your fellow man. And in the Jewish person's mind, they have bought in to Jesus on Monday. And this is it. This is a Trump rally on steroids. Their Savior has come. He's going to deliver them from the Romans. In their mind, in their mind, this is the end of their oppression. This is the end of having leadership they don't like. This is the political solution in their mind. Thank God Jesus is coming, overthrowing Herod, overthrowing Caesar. We're going to be free again. They're so excited. And so they began to wave palm branches. They took off their coats, the Bible says, and laid their coats on the ground so the donkey would walk on their coats and not get its feet dirty. Now, you and I, a coat has a value to it. I don't know, you know, now you're starting to pull your coats out of the closet. And, and for some people, a coat is just a coat and you don't care. But for some people, a coat is a fashion. For, for some people, a coat is a statement, you know, and, and the type of coat and the brand you wear says a lot about you. For the granola people, you have certain coats you wear. For the biker people, you have certain coats you wear. For the farmer people, you have, I mean, you're wearing your car hearts. We can tell a lot about you by your coat, maybe. Black leather jacket, what are you thinking? Biker, Carhartts, farmer, okay? North face, weird. <laughs> Just kidding, North face people. Full length trench coat, boring, okay, whatever. <laughs> but coats, clothing, was a much more sacred item in this culture. They didn't have Walmarts and Targets. Everything was handmade, and, and it was a lot more valuable as part of their normal budget for clothing. If they lost a coat, it wasn't just go out to Walmart and get one for $29 or Goodwill. 
you had to work hard to come up with a coat. And so for them to lay their coats in the ground, this was a big deal. They're saying, this is it. This is our moment. We're being set free. The Romans are going away, and Jesus is going to give us free food and miracles for all. And when they stuck their necks out like that, it was also an insult to the Romans. Okay. But Jesus did not do what they wanted when they wanted it. We, we have this in our culture. Some of you have seen the, 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 telev- the, the television commercial, J.G. Wentworth. It's my money, and I want it now. And if you want to cue that video, and while you're cueing that video, uh, there's a song we used to sing, you know, I want it all, and I want it now. We are a now society. Human nature wants it now. I'm going to show you a video, and this is a corny video. It may bring back some childhood trauma. If you ever watch this movie, like I watched, I, I've never been able to get through this movie because it's the dumbest movie ever made. This is the stupidest movie by a million, million, jillion. And if you're watching on social media today, sometimes when we play a movie, it kicks the feed for a minute. Switch over to YouTube if that happens. Let's show the video. Hey, Daddy, I want a golden goose. Here we go again. All right, sweetheart, all right. Daddy will get you a golden goose as soon as we get home. No, I want one of those. Bunker, how much do you want for the golden goose? They're not for sale. Name your price. She can't have one. Who says I can't? The man with a funny hat. I want one. I want a golden goose. Gooses. Geeses. I want my geese to lay gold eggs for Easter. It will, sweetheart. At least a hundred a day. Anything you say. And by the way... What? I want a feast. You ate before you came to the factory. I want a bean feast. Oh, one of those. Cream buns and donuts and fruitcake with no nuts. So good you could go nuts. You're going to have all those things when you get home. No, now. I want a ball. I want a party. Pink macaroons and a million balloons and performing baboons. And give it to me. <laughs> now. I want the ball. Oh, wall. that's good. Thank you, maestro. Now, if we can, we'll have counseling set up later today if that was traumatic for you like it was for me. But that was goofy. That was awful. And it was silly. He said, that was ridiculous. Pastor, this is a church service. This ought to be serious. You know, this is theology. This, give give me some meat here, Pastor. That wasn't meat. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you the meat of that. That's what we look like. That's human nature. That's what we look like when God does not give us what we want, when we want. That is what we, I'm sure that when when God is looking over the sills of heaven and hearing us complain and whine and cry, I'm sure that's what he sees. And I, I, I know I'm as guilty as everybody else. Man, I tell you. That's all I can do to keep the knees in my jeans and my clothes. i got to be on my knees repenting so often. Maybe. That's what we look like. And the Jewish people at this time, they had that mentality. They wanted the kingdom now, and Jesus did not give it to them now. And on Monday, they shouted, Hosanna. But what did they say on Friday? Crucify him. It's amazing how fickle the crowd can be. But you see, God does not give us what we want when we want at all times. And even when we look at things politically or we look at elections that are going on, we say, how did that person get in office? How did this happen? Or maybe you even do feel cheated by your candidate in 2012 or 2016. But I'm just here to tell you In the kingdom of God, you're not going to always get what you want when you want it. I would like to be able to guarantee you a golden goose, but I cannot do that. There's two words in the Greek. One is kairos, one is chronos. As a matter of fact, kairos is interesting. We have a group called kairos at our church that goes into the prisons. They're in there today. 
They're, they're, they're getting ready to do an awesome ceremony here this afternoon, and many of the, of the inmates are going to give their hearts to Christ today, and we've been praying for them since Thursday on this, and, and what a wonderful team we have in there, and just remember to lift those guys up as they're in there today. But Kairos and Kronos. Kronos is where we get the word chronology. It's the time we have on earth. It's how you know to be here at 10. It's how you know that tomorrow is Monday and you need to go to work. It's how we know what day your birthday is. It's how we know when Christmas is, December 25th. Or how you know when Thanksgiving is. Well, maybe you'll get that. Kronos is how we tell time and track time on earth. God does not work by chronos. He does not work based on what our wristwatch says or our cell phone says. God works based on kairos, which means God's time. God is on a completely different timetable. God's timetable was this, eternity past, present, and eternity future all in one vision. And he sees it all at once. It is profound. That is God time. And God, his time, and the Bible says in Isaiah right around chapter 55, it says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And when we look at Kairos time versus Kronos time, God's timetable is greater than man's timetable. I would have thought it was cool if Jesus established his kingdom back then. If you're a random everyday Jew, and man, all of a sudden your oppression is gone, and you don't have to listen to all this anymore, and you're getting free bread, man, life is good. But Jesus didn't do that. And I think even today, we're looking sometimes for a political solution. We're saying, man, get this candidate in. Get this candidate in. Lord, if you would just do this. Lord, if you would just do that. We're trying to tell God how to do his job. We got to be careful with that. Now, I do believe, yes, I believe. Vote, vote your conscience, pray, believe God. And there are certain things we want to see done. But I'm here to tell you, <coughs> there may be things that don't go how we want them to go. <coughs> but if that happens, I'm going to trust the Kairos time more than the Kronos time. Galatians 6 and 9, let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Isaiah 40 and 31, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm getting over. Had one of those, everybody gets this time of year. It was no good. I'm better now, but this Got a little bit left in my lungs. Habakkuk 2, verse 3, the vision is yet for an appointed time, but the end of it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. There are some things we're looking for. I'm going to be talking about Jesus becoming king today. I know there's a lot of you that want Jesus to come back right now, and I hope that he does too, but there's a good chance he's not. It would help the Colts out a whole lot if he came back in the next few minutes. <laughs> but sometimes we're saying Jesus come back and it's almost like those Jews back then they were wanting Jesus to establish his earthly kingdom for their convenience and not for God's purpose and I do believe we have to be careful sometimes I hear people saying I wish Jesus would come back I want Jesus to come back but all Sometimes the motive is not because you want to say, see Jesus as much as you just want to be delivered from your mortgage payment. You want to, you know, so, sometimes we're using that as an escape. We're using that because we're, we're tired of this world, and it is a nasty world, and I, I don't make light of that, and nobody wants to be paying a mortgage for 30 years, and, and, and if you've got snot-nosed brats you're raising, you want the, Jesus to come back just to save you from having to deal with that. If, you know, maybe, maybe you've been married for 45 years, and you're done with that person, but you can't divorce them, and you know, you're just like, all right, Jesus, just come back. 
<laughs> you say, Pastor, that stuff would never happen. You ought to sit in my office from time to time. It happens. But you know, I don't want Jesus to come back just to spare me from some, some, some temporary hardship. I want the timing of God and the plan of God. The last thing I want to do is have Jesus come back and people miss heaven because we didn't go tell. What needs to happen before Jesus comes back? Point two. There was this old school kind of soothsayer to a king, whether you call him a prophet, an astrologer, whatever he was, he was goofy. And the king had a mistress, and the prophet came to him and said, Your mistress is going to die. And sure enough, the woman died a short time later. The king was outraged. That was his favorite mistress. And he was just upset that that prophecy came to pass. So he called the prophet in. He said, look, I don't like you, so I'm going to tell you what. I have the power of your life in my hands. Prophesy to me, prophet. When are you going to die? And the prophet said, well, I'm going to pray right now. Okay, I prayed. Here's the deal. I know that whenever I die, you will die three days later. Anyways, you'll get that tomorrow, some of you. <laughs> when is Jesus coming back? When is he setting up his kingdom like we want? Well, the general rule of thumb we use when we discuss this is Matthew 24, verse 36. Nobody knows the day or the hour. It amazes me, it amazes me that there are still people trying to figure out the day and the hour. And they try to have a presence on social media and in churches, and they try to say, oh, it's going to be this, it's going to be that. It. What part of nobody knows the day and the hour do you not understand? Let me repeat that. Nobody knows the day or the hour. But how close are we? Well, we're close. When your child asks you, how will I know when I know it's the right one to marry? And our token answer is what? You'll just know. Doesn't work out about 50% of the time. How close are we to Jesus coming back? Let me get, tell you three indicators. Number one is Israel. The whole time clock of the world is based on Israel time. We see from the Holy Bible every scripture that needs to happen in Israel before Jesus would come back has been almost filled. There's one, maybe one more, and they're working on it, that rebuilding a temple. Israel reformed as a nation in 1948. There is a prophecy that says it would be one generation within that time frame of Israel becoming a nation again. Now, there's different mathematical formulas that people use. What is a generation? Some put it at 40 years. Some put it as much as 100 years. Bottom line, soon. Israel dominated the Six-Day War in 1967. Is currently fighting on seven different fronts, and her enemies have been emboldened by foolishness. And bottom line, we know that one of the things that's going to happen is that the whole world is going to gang up on Israel as part of one of the last things that happened before Jesus takes over. The Messiah, Jesus, every messianic prophecy has been fulfilled except those having to do with the second coming of Christ. Everyone has been filled. The book of Revelation. All technology is in place for every aspect of the book of Revelation. There's so much of the book of Revelation we could not have understood 50 years ago. 
or 100 years ago. There, there, there's things, you know, like those not having the mark of the beast, which would be on your wrist or your forehead, not being able to buy and sell in this time of pre-Armageddon. And what do we see today? I mean, people thought that would be a microchip or something like that. Where do you hold your cell phone? If, if you are John the Revelator, you're John the Revelator, living in about 70, 60 to 70 A.D., you've never seen electricity, you've never seen cars, you've never seen airplanes. There is no telephone, telegram, telegraph, nothing. And you're trying to describe a cell phone. How do we do business? Anymore, I mean, Google Pay, what do you do? You just put your phone on the little pad and it pays for you. My goodness. When, when the two prophets come in the book of Revelation to preach that the world's going to hate, the Bible says the whole world is watching through a lens, through an eye. What's an eye? It's a lens. How does the whole world get to see one event today? It's there. When you begin reading the, the depictions of these, these descriptions of the book of Revelation, of these horrible explosions and the earth being rocked, it's like, oh my gosh, that's nuclear war. Everything in the book of Revelation is in place. It's there. It's there. It's possible. We have an economy becoming more and more dependent on each other. We have television and satellites, nations emerging that would easily be the ten-horned beast. We have the United Nations. We have uh, in, in other nations, they, they, they have what's called a social credit score. This is happening in China, other places. I mean, it, it is just, when you begin to read about it, it's, it's amazing based on how you, you, your views line up with the government views, gives you certain social permissions in life. You can't travel if you don't have a certain social score. You're being forbid to do business if you don't line up. We see Israel, Israel's enemies. We know there's going to be a global crisis that's going to precede the Antichrist coming to power. Have we seen any evidence that that could happen pretty quick? It's amazing. The Bible talks about a great whore emerging there are different speculations about this great whore. But when you read the descriptions of her and you look at our modern day entertainment and so many things that we exalt and how quickly people rise to the top, it doesn't take a stretch of the imagination to realize when the time comes, it's not going to be hard to, to make it happen. The church, there's basically, I think, two things left the church needs to do before Jesus comes back. Number one is Matthew 24, 14 says, the gospel shall be preached to the entire earth before Jesus comes back. There's 130,000, I'm sorry, 13,000 people groups on this earth, 8 billion people, and we have reached about 90% of them. 90%. The gospel is available in 99% of languages to cover 99% of those people. And the gospel is available to 90% of the world's population. We have in the, the missionary vocabulary something called the 1040 window. That's the section of the earth that's between 10 degrees latitude and 40 degrees latitude. And between those two degrees, we have the bulk of the unreached people groups in Iraq, China, Iran, India, and North Africa. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, pray the Lord to send laborers 
to the harvest. I've seen it with my own eyes. And I, I, this church is, we are so blessed. The Lord has allowed us to be a part of this. I, 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 it's hard to describe, ladies and gentlemen. But to be in Pakistan, and as far as you can see, people standing shoulder to shoulder with no space in between the rows for hours. The last time I went, it rained, and they were standing in the rain. And in a simple, this might be, you might not be able to comprehend this, but I only preached 20 minutes. That's all you, their attention spans, that's all you can do. And a 20-minute message, 50, 60, 70, 80,000 people give their hearts to Christ and the second largest Muslim nation in the world. And that's happening in so many Muslim nations. Pastor Kim Norris from Bloomington is coming uh, to our Living Waters Conference to speak. He goes to Indonesia, the number one Muslim country in all the world. And he's saying, Pastor, they're getting saved in Indonesia. We are making progress. The gospel is getting out. <laughs> you say, let, let me help you for just a moment. Be careful, the Americanism. That's nice, Pastor, but I came for a nice message today. That's your problem. That's your problem. If we hear about this, and our heart doesn't just go, oh, God, make me part of the solution. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, that's a heart problem. That's a heart problem. We need to get full of Jesus to where it changes how we see the world. I know that folks are very excited about what they see happening with our teens and children and vertical ministries. And, and, and I don't want to just, I, I, I don't want Steve to get a big head or anything. But the man has sacrificed so much to lead these kids. You know how much Steve gets paid from this church to do that? Zero. He's given up business opportunities, money-making opportunities. He slowed the pace of his business life down so he could be more available. To the, they're going to a movie after church today to take them to encourage their faith. He's texting them all hours of the day, loving on them, being there for them, going to their games or sports events. And he's so driven because he understands that if we don't reach him, the world's not going to. Please don't ever let yourself be guilty of, of, a, of only a self-seeking Christianity that says, well, I got my fire insurance, so Lord bless me. My name is Jimmy. I'll take all you can give me. And, I'll, and then please come back before it gets too hard. And quite frankly, that's the way a lot of us think. But we have to have a heart that's been transformed by the gospel that says, unless we are part of reaching others, it's not enough. In Ephesians 5, it tells us that Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Now, there's two ways to look at this. If that means we got to get all y'all 100% clean and living right, stop cussing and live 100% live holy before Jesus comes back, he ain't ever coming back. Andrew said, no offense. I didn't say it. No. Take offense. No, I'm kidding. If, if, if we got to wait until Paul Estep gets it all together 
we ain't going. Y'all ever have that in your class where, you know, you, the, the teacher said, okay, if you guys don't stop talking, we're taking away recess. There'd be some idiot that wouldn't stop talking and you had to miss your recess. Now, we're not allowed to say that these days, but that's what swirlies were for, right? <laughs> Y'all you know, you ever have that, that one person that ruins it for everybody? Man, 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 listen, where's Erlene at? She's sitting back there. See, we'd be out. If, I mean, if, if, if all we have to do is be a church without spot or wrinkle, we, we could be out of here, but Erlene, you know, as long as Erlene's around, we ain't got a chance. Well, the fact is, as long as I'm around, we ain't got a chance. So if we're waiting for moral perfection, that ain't going to happen. So the way he comes back for a church without spot or wrinkle is we've got to be washed in the blood of Jesus. It's by the grace of God. It is by we are the righteousness of God in Christ. That's the only way we're going to fulfill that. And so we have to say either A, he's never coming back, or B, it's already been fulfilled. I'm going to go with B. You with me? All right. And that leads us, lastly, John 14, 12, Jesus says, greater works shall you do than these. The word greater there in the Greek is the word mazon, means larger, more, or elder. In John 21 and 25, it says, all the books in the world at that time could not contain the works of Jesus. And Jesus says, yet you're going to do even better than this. So I wonder, ha have we seen a day where we've done greater miracles than Jesus? And if we talk about greater as far as the magnitude, I don't know that we have. But if we talk about greater as the number of multitude, I think after 2,000 years, we probably caught up a little bit. So there's a shot there. One of two things is going to happen. Either we're going to have a greater in multitude or we're going to, we have yet to see some of the greatest miracles that eyes have ever seen before Jesus comes back. One of those two. I personally think it's the multitude and not the magnitude. So what are we waiting on before Jesus comes back? Number one, we got to reach that last 10% of the world. And number two, we have to make sure that greater things than Jesus, as far as quantity or quality of miracles, has happened. And I'm guessing it's quantity. And we might already be there by now. Who knows? And that brings me to this. What happens to make Jesus the king? And this is what we call the rapture. How many have heard the term the rapture before? Most of you. Okay. The word rapture means catching away. That word is not in the Bible. But it describes something that is repeated many times in the Bible. Now there's three schools of thought on the rapture. Actually, and I'm going to give you a fourth today. There are people who's what's called a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, when we see, y'all okay, well, I'm giving you a little theology, but everybody says, oh, pastor, we need to know about the end times. Well, here we are. What's going to take for Jesus to come back? The rapture, the pre-trib, we are currently living in the church age. The dispensation was called grace, where when you sin, okay, like, you know, Brian here, probably, you know, yelled at his daughters on the way to church because they were late to church or something. I don't know. They were taking too long, took all the hot water, whatever it was. Brian's yelling at him. He gets in the flesh. Under the Old Testament, Brian would have to go sacrifice Bessie the cow or Lucky the lamb, and that blood would be shed to atone for Brian's sin of yelling at his daughters. Even though they deserved it, he had the wrong tone of voice. We're in the dispensation of Jesus is after the cross. We have grace so that we're saved not of ourselves, not of works, but by grace we've been saved through faith in Jesus Christ. That though we've sinned, we're justified just as if I'd never sinned. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. Even though our righteousness is as filthy rags, we have free access into the throne room of heaven, direct access to God. You can call out the name of Jesus anywhere, anytime, any place. He heals you, he hears you, and he responds. Amen. Got it? All right. The next dispensation 
It's called the tribulation. That's what the book of Revelation is about. It's going to be a mess. It lasts seven years. It's going to be absolute hell on earth. The, rev the, the tribulation is not God's judgment. The tribulation is God's mercy. He's trying to say one more time before this thing wraps up, please don't go to hell. And yet there's going to be people, their hearts get harder and harder and harder, and they're going to hate the things of God. Now what the rapture is, the rapture is when the church, Christians, born again people, are taken out of this world system. Now, there's three views on that rapture. Number one, pre-tribulation, that before the tribulation happens, before those seven years, there's going to be a trumpet sound, and we're going to teach some scriptures if we have time, that the church goes up and we don't have to stay around and tribulate. There's a small minority of people that we're going to study here if we have time today in Revelation 14, 14, that believe the rapture comes halfway through the tribulation at the three and a half year mark into the tribulation, okay? Uh, and they have a valid scripture for that, Revelation 14, 14. There are others who believe that you got to stay for the whole seven years and he who endures to the end shall be saved. And only at the end of those seven years does Jesus rapture the church. Okay, those are the three prevailing thoughts. One of the main scriptures we have, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, verse through 18, Paul speaks, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, in other words, those who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. You know, Paul is telling us, hey, you don't, you don't have to be sad when somebody dies. Now, of course, we're gonna, it's bittersweet. It's going to be sad for a little bit, but you don't have to walk on in depression the rest of your life because you lost a loved one. If they knew Jesus, they wouldn't come back to your sorry butt if they could. But well, we were married for so long, and we were great friends and all that kind of stuff. They ain't coming back. They're waiting for you to get there. But it says, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Others, we ought to grieve differently than our worldly counterparts. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do you believe that today? Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede them that are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And this we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. These are good words. These are comforting words, praise God. First thing he says, he says, don't be ignorant. You know, there's a lot of Christians that are ignorant. We're ignorant because we don't read the Bible. We're ignorant because we don't go to church. Hey, let me, I want to tell you something. I meant to say this earlier. I want you to do me a favor, and I mean this as your pastor, as someone who loves you, cares for your soul. God gives me a vision every year for this church, for you, and I want to share something I think is important for you. Every now and then you have to miss church. I get that. That's part of life. When you miss church, watch it online. Go back and catch up later. Okay, why? Because I only get about 42 to 43 Sundays a year with you. By the time I'm gone for some mission trips, by the time I take a couple weeks off for vacation myself, and, and, and then the times you miss that type of thing, those words, I believe the words we have, this is not just a pep rally. This isn't just making you feel good. This is vision. This is, this is the direction that I believe that God has for us collectively and for us as individuals. So if you miss, go back and read it or go back and get, the, get, get, get it online and, and, and get, get, stay with it. One of the things, every pastor hates this. Someone comes up, Pastor, you should preach on such and such. Brother, last Sunday, I did a seven-part series on such and such. You know, or what's even worse is they say, you should preach on such and such, and you just preached eight weeks on such and such. And they're telling on themselves, I wasn't in church for eight weeks. Every pastor is like, oh, my goodness gracious. We walk in love. You know, we're not like some of you sweet ladies. That when you say, oh, bless your heart, what you really mean is, aren't you stupid? We don't, we don't mean that. But don't be ignorant. He says, don't sorrow. We ought to grieve differently than the world grieves. It says, the dead shall rise first. 
Now, what Jesus said to the thief on the cross really gives some insight in this. Remember what he said to the thief on the cross? Today you'll be with me in where? Paradise. Praise God. The dead, those who go, the Christians who go before you and I, they go up. Isn't that good news? You know, there are some people, atheist, atheist people, it's, oh, man, when you die, you just stay in that, you just stay six feet in the ground all the rest of the world's eternity. No, you don't. Everybody's going to live forever. You just get to make a reservation, smoking or non-smoking. There's going to be a shout. Let me tell you something. Boring Christianity is for the birds, all right? There's going to be a shout. We ought to be excited what about the things of God? And I'm going to tell you, when Jesus comes back, he's, he, he's coming back, and it's going to be a big woo-hoo, buddy. I don't know if he's going to go a woo-hoo, a yee what he's going to do, but there's something coming. There, there is a shout. Ladies and gentlemen, heaven is exciting. Men, I want you to understand something. Heaven, and, and sometimes we think church, oh, man, we real kind of boring. We just go kind of be quiet, just kind of stare at the wall a little bit and, and just kind of get through it for an hour and a half and keep the wife off our back. That's not church. Man, church is exciting. The Word of God is exciting. Watching people be plucked out of hell and given an eternity in heaven is exciting. Watching families transform is exciting. Watching teenagers, how many testimonies have we heard up here? I was suicidal. I was depressed. I was wanting to run away. My life was about to come to an end. But then Jesus found me. Church is exciting. Ladies, I, I mean, it's a privilege to be a part of the things of God. And when I think about Jesus coming back, there's going to be a shout. It's not going to be, well, Margaret, I guess he's coming back today. You suppose we're ready for the rapture, Margaret? I don't know, Vern. Man, get some passion in your faith. Get some zest. Get a little kick in your step. You are a Christian, a blood-bought, born-again, heaven-bound, Holy Ghost-filled, devil-stomping man or woman of God. That's who you are. He's coming back with a shout, not a whisper. There's going to be a trumpet blast. I love it. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That means we're going up, baby. We're going up. Those of you, many of you, who always wanted to dunk, <laughs> and you could not, this is your chance. Mike, Ed, your prayer. Lord, when you come back, please let me have a basketball in my hand, and let me get one in on the way out. But if you don't, I'll tell you all about it for eternity. <laughs> How good I was. Emphasis on was. <laughs> we will meet them in the air. Gee, now, at the point of the rapture, Jesus is not coming back to earth yet. He's coming to bring us up, but he ain't coming down just yet. We'll meet him up there. It says, we will always be with the Lord. That's good news. These words are to comfort one another. Daggone it, I'm out of time. We're just getting started. I know I, know I had that little place in the middle. I was giving you some theology, and y'all were looking at it like. But now we're getting excited again. Jesus is coming back. We're always going to be with the Lord. Comfort one another. This is supposed to give us comfort. Matthew 24, the day and the hour, no one knows. Verse 36 through 44, let me give you this first. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Emphasis, the days of Noah. For in as the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. These two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, you do not know what hour the Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed the house to be broken into. 
Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Now, <laughs> I'm going to start giving myself away. Pastor, are you pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib? Yes. I'm pan-trib. It all pans out. But actually, I'm going to tell you here in just a minute. Well, I, won't, I won't get to it today. You have to come back for next time. But I want to tell you what I think. I think it's very possible we are pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. Why does there have to be only one? We have scriptural evidence for all three. It'll be as the days of Noah. So what, now let, let me help you all, you conspiracy theorists living in fear. I love you. But you all think, oh man, we're, you, you think we're going to be around for this apocalypse and you're, you're preparing for the zombies coming and eating all your stuff and all that kind of stuff and all hell breaking loose. What's the Bible say? First, first of all, Jesus is talking about, he says, comfort one another with these words. The, the, if the second coming of Christ is bringing fear and not comfort, we don't understand it correctly. I'm going to say that again because if, if when we talk about the second coming of Christ and it produces fear, or, and the reason why preachers preach fear is because it produces offerings. Just like the reason why political candidates go negative. Negativity produces votes. Preachers preach, that's, we cannot read these scriptures and come away fearful. Okay? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't have a stash. It's wise to have a six-month supply. I've said that many times. We saw in COVID, we need a six-month supply. We're, we're so close to being completely hacked, our grids, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we can be without power for a certain length of time. That is a reality we face every day now. So you ought to have some vegetables in your cabinets. And we found out toilet paper is pretty important too. <laughs> or some old t-shirts, one of the two. <laughs> but the rapture, talking about the second coming of Christ, watch this now. They will be marrying and giving in marriage. Okay. Two will be in the field. What's that tell you? There's fields that will be worked. What's that tell you? It tells you life is happening. That makes sense? I didn't say that. Jesus said that. Okay. As the days of Noah, what happened in Noah's day? Did the flood come and the chaos come? And then it's like, oh, let's get Noah out of here. What happened, let's take care of Noah, then the flood came. It is as the days of Noah. God takes care of his people. God, God takes care of us. Now you say, Pastor, what if you're wrong and we have to stay and tribulate? I've got enough Holy Ghost to you. Can I just be, can I, can, listen, listen to me. We need to settle this. We need to settle this. Now, I mentioned Pakistan. We drive by terrorist camps. They say, let's see over there. That's a terrorist training center. They get a hold of me. That's bad. Is that possible? Yeah. What, what would you do? Andrew would be like, hey, I, I'm free. I'm not going to ransom him out. How much is he worth? Praise God. That's not what she'd be like. But it's real. It's real. I've settled it. Have you? Have you settled it? If you had, if you had to go through extreme hardship, would, would, would you keep your faith? Or would you, would you cry out in doubt and unbelief? Settle it. Man, the worst thing they can do is, is make you uncomfortable for a while and then send you to heaven. Settle it. Settle it. But I do believe the days of Noah, t two women grinding at the mill, one will be taking the other left. Well, if they're grinding at the mill, there's food. Y'all catch that? See, 
be, be careful about a fear-based gospel. Now, I am afraid of hell. I, I'll tell you, I, I do not want to go to hell. I'm, I'm not afraid of the devil, but I'm, I, do not want, I would never want to lose my soul to hell. Would you? Have you? I've read the account. I do not want to go to hell. I mean, part of the reason I'm saved when I recently got saved is I don't want to go to hell. It wasn't I want to be holy. It wasn't I want to learn to live like Christ. It was I don't want to burn. I believe this stuff. Someone preached it. It became real to me. The thought of hell was very real. I was like, I don't want that. I just don't want that. Well, we'll have to pick it up here. Because otherwise, I can just see you're getting grumpy little tummies. We can't have you, the Baptist beating you to Bob Evans, and you have to wait to get a table, and then you'll start cussing and all that kind of good stuff. Cussing at that waitress, treating her bad because you had to wait. I'll tell you what, you know I'm just joking around with you, right? I think you know that. If you don't know that, it's a joke, people. You're just having a good time. If you are going to cuss, take your Jesus 2024. And also your Soul Harvest Church name tag, take them off. <laughs> Along those lines, I'll tell you this and I'll let you go. We're knocking on doors yesterday here in Cloverdale. <laughs> and there's a couple doors we knocked on. It's like, don't breathe because we're going to get high as a kite. <laughs> and Arlene was in my group. Arlene was going, ah. <laughs> Pastor, we going out for some brownies after this? <laughs> Pastor, I'm hungry. I got the munchies. Man, I love this evangelism. It feels good. <laughs> we came up to one house. We're on the front door, man. I'm like, oh, Jesus, don't let me get high. Don't let this get on me. Lord, just keep it quick. Don't get high. We walk around the corner, and in their yard that we couldn't see from the front, but we could see from the side, we saved a seat for you at Soul Harvest Church. <laughs> I did not look up whose house that was, nor will I look up whose house that was. But if that's you, maybe you... <laughs> Say the blessing before you partake. <laughs> Just kidding. You may want to look at that. I think God's got a better plan for you than that. Amen. Amen. <laughs> True story. You know, when the... Uh, there's a scene from Band of Brothers. Some of you have seen that HBO documentary about the World War II Easy Company, a fantastic series. Toward the end, they discover the concentration camps. And they'd heard rumors, but now they're seeing it's real. And they're seeing these figures that look like just these walking skeletons with a little bit of skin sagging off of them. And the men are overwhelmed with compassion, and they begin to just feed them whatever they have. You know, they're, take my candy bar, take this meal ration, take this. But we know from history that the doctors were screaming, the medics, don't feed them, don't feed them. And it's not that they didn't need food, but it was that their digestive systems were so wrecked, they couldn't handle what they, the Americans or the Allied Forces food supply was, and it would do more harm. So when the good stuff came, their system would not be working properly to take it in. As your pastor And I see the souls of mankind and even out and about yesterday and 
praying with people, you saw generational poverty and generational addiction. Sometimes we're starved. But as your pastor, I can't always give you what you want to eat. I have to feed you what you need to eat. Does that make sense? And as we're reading these accounts, and we didn't even, I, I ran out of time today. I thought, I, and I cut off about 40% of my message before I even got here this morning, just so you know. It was. Jesus says so many times, be watchful. You don't know when the master's coming back. Be ready, be ready, be ready. And I want to implore you with everything within me. Let's not have a diet of spiritual junk food. And let's not eat things that would be harmful to us. Let's get ready. Because Jesus is coming. We don't know when. But at the very least, this life is but a vapor. And we'll all be standing for, before him very soon. Father, I ask you to bless these people. Thank you for the words that were ministered today, even the theology in the middle that we needed. We ask you as we go to sink these deep in our spirit and to help us to live our life reflecting that you're not just our fire insurance, but you are our Lord. We give ourselves to you. And we ask for your help and guidance this week, your safety and protection, your encouragement, and your joy. Amen. If you need prayer, we have prayer partners down here. We'll see you out there. We're dismissed.